and they eat <clears throat> hot and spicy salsa, Tabasco, red peppers. They love mangoes. They can munch for hours on cashews. Olives sit in bronze bowls on the cherry tables next to their canopy beds where the solace of pillows swallows their sweet heads and the quiet of silk lies across their happy backs. They know the altruism of material things. They want to say to us, we'll sleep next to you. Feel our soft and unimposing flutter across your shoulders on your heartbroken feet. They want us to take, eat, smell the wood, run our tired fingers over the rim of every glass, give our eyes the chance to see the metal bend and curve its way into the oval of a chair. They want us to feel the holiness of scratching where it itches, rubbing where it hurts. They want us to take long, steamy showers and a nap. They know how easily we follow directions, hook the red wire to the front of the furnace, fill in only the top half of the insurance form. They have no manuals for joy. They can't fix anything we break. They wonder why we never laugh enough, why we don't know God is crazy for deep massage and loves to wail on an alto sax whenever they dance. <clears throat> That's a poem, the altruism of, or the materialism of angels. And um, I want Margaret now to come up and I'll just move my lips. <laughs> I'd like Hannah to come up and sing these, and uh, I'll just sit down. <laughs> and I want Rod to come up and write all the rest of them. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Poetry is a wonderful art uh, to take part in because nobody wants it. <laughs> The phone is never rung, never once. Jack, poem, I, I need a poem. <clears throat> so you always know you're doing it for an authentic reason, I guess. That's actually a protest poem. Uh, I was raised and worked and spent a lot of years in places that were quite uh, religiously grim. And I always thought, they're always trying to get me to heaven. But what are they going to do when they get there and they go, oh, my God, joy? I don't know anything about joy. I <laughs> we never had joy. So it's nice to be in a, a, warm, a warm place that uh, understands joy. If you aren't a poetry person, you can leave now. That's okay. Um, but think about why, because you were at one time, um, certainly, you, were, you even made up words with musical sounds when you were a kid, you know. Um, so somewhere along the way, what took it away, something took it away. If, if you still are, well, congratulations. I'm one of the people who didn't stop, and I'm fascinated about why. Uh, why didn't I stop? It seems like everybody else tends to stop. When I taught, it was all about restoring poems to students. Hardly any of them came in. It all pretty much had it taken away. And uh, my job was to give it back to them so they could have that. So I kind of hope that happens today for those of you who had it, had it taken away. First thing to go is the music, and you hunker down in front and are asked what the poem means. Thus the topic, or the, the title of today is Beyond Meaning. I don't really care about meaninglessness. That's a whole Western hang-up. Um, we can go into the existential philosophical reasons that exists. Um, but uh, I used to say to the students, uh, you, you know, Wordsworth has this poem, I'd rather be a pagan and a creed outworn. And they'd say, oh my gosh, you mean you'd worship a tree? And I said, yeah, you, if you did, you'd be nicer to it. You know? um, don't have a problem with that myself. Um, 
I think it would bring out some pretty good things. I've never said I'm a poet in the United States, not once in 50 years. But the second day we were in Ireland, and, and that we were in Ireland where I was to be for the year, and um, one of the people in the street said, oh, you're new in town, are you? And I said, yeah, and what are you now? And I said, oh, I'm a poet. Oh, come down to the pub tonight now, won't you now? Read to us, please, for goodness sakes. My God, a poet is here. Well, I'll tell everybody, you know. <laughs> When I'm on an airplane, you know, uh, so what do you do? I, oh, I sell things. Um, <laughs> so what does it mean to be beyond meaning? It means the poetry really, and Hannah really, and Ra, and, and all that, is it's a, it's a way into being. And we're, we don't get to be in being very often. We're in meaning and belief and all kinds of hear up things and the poetry poetry is a place so if you were with the angels and they were they were rubbing your back like you were in being with them you didn't turn around and go what's that mean you didn't do that you know so that this morning i hope these poems take you into uh, places of being um this is a I don't have to say these pontifical things, do I? Uh, about it's a tough time to be in, etc. Um, you know, I, I I listened to a CD on the way up, and I, so I haven't caught up on the latest terrorist attack. Uh, it's terrible getting you have not getting used to it, but having expectations. Um, And I appreciated, Rod, what you were saying. So this is a poem for Rod, and the rest of you can listen in. <laughs> Against elegies. I'm tired of death's allure, of how the old beggar makes me think that rowing across the river is somehow richer, more serious than the center of a pomegranate, or my dog's way of sleeping on his paws. I'm tired of the beauty of the elegy, the tone-deaf lyricism of it all. I went deaf to listen for a while to Bud Powell or Art Blakey, to have to stare for seven hours at Matisse. I want him to do stand-up and play the banjo, to have to tap dance and juggle, to play Trivial Pursuit and weed my garden. I'm tired of how death throws his voice, gets us to judge a begonia, a song in the shower, a voice, an old dog. I want life's ragged way of getting along. The wasted afternoon, an empty morning, a sloppy kiss. I want to stagger along between innings. I want the burnt toast, the forgotten note, the lost pillowcase, the dime novel, and the silly putty of it all. <clears throat> there's this uh, biblical injunction pray without ceasing I always this is about the thousandth time I've said this I worked at a college where some people were getting close <laughs> <laughs> but there was laundry <laughs> so um, this is a poem where I try to come to terms with that and I think I believe it. I, I do. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Because it's it, 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 it's beyond meaning. What does it mean to pray without seeing? It's just beyond meaning. I was reading a book on prayer by the Benedictine. I love the Benedictines. They have a vow of hospitality. So I always thought if I was going to join, I would join the Benedictines because every the others you have to give things up. But hospitality can just get bigger and bigger, you know, and you can just say, more beer, sure, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> so I was reading this book by a Benedictine monk, John Chapman, and in the book he said this marvelously, marvelous conundrum. He said, pray as you can, not as you can't. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> 
our uh, <laughs> <laughs> the poem's title is uh, After Reading Dom John Chapman, Benedict and Abbott. Epigraph, pray as you can, not as you can't. My prayers will sit on the backs of bedraggled donkeys, in the sidecars of Harleys, in the pockets of night watchmen, on the laps of widows. They will be the stones I walk by, the smudges I leave on anything I touch, the last place the last snow melts. They will be brown. Weekdays, potato pancakes. They will stick to the undersides of porches, docks, dog paws, and carpets. When I'm sick, my cough will carry them. When you leave in the morning, they will sink into the bed, the sofa, every towel. I will carry them in the modesty of my feet. Everything will be praying. My dog will be petitioning for mercy when he stops to sniff a post. Every window in our house will be an offering for supplication. The birds at the feeder will be twitching for my sins. I will say my prayers are bread dough, doorknobs, golf tees, any small and nameless change of heart. When I forget my prayers, they will bundle up and go out on their own across the street, down into the basement, or into a small town with no mayor where there's a single swing in the park. When I forget, they'll know I was watching TV, the sky, or listening to Basie, remembering the way my mother and father jitterbug to the big band station, he pulling her close, then spinning her out across the green kitchen floor. I was uh, tugging away at my bag here. I bring this, this uh, bag everywhere I go. It was, it's a fishing bag, but it's the bag my wife used. What are you doing here? It's the one. <laughs> you don't belong in a sanctuary, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Come unto me. <laughs> it was a, a bag my, my wife carried her books in in college. So this is how I, everywhere I go, at least she's behind me going, I'm going to read that one again. <laughs> you are with me. How are we doing? Are we done yet? <laughs> I'm, Sometimes these uh, these little moments of of uh, being can be just very light. Uh, one of my mentors was uh, the poet William Stafford, and and Bill used to say, uh, when something's going on, something else is going on. Watch for that. And it was always so sweet, you know, because you realize you can suddenly narrow down. You're really seeing the same way all the time. Have to break through that a little bit you know, now and then. He also had a, any of you writers out there, you probably you may know this if you've come across him. And the great antidote for being blocked, and maybe it's for everything. And we talked about this this morning. Actually, I imposed my will on everybody. But um, uh, he would say, "Writers block. Oh, lower your standards." <laughs> Don't you love that? You know, so good. You know. I also had a friend who was accosted about uh, getting to heaven, and he was just, he had, he had a hangover. That made it all the worse. And he, he's sitting there like this, and he's, oh, man, you know. And they, they, well, don't you want to be in heaven? There'll, be, there'll just be choirs and dancing and singing. And, and he went, oh, my God, that sounds so exhausting. I, <laughs> so I, I just love the refreshment that's in this room. It feels... Marvelous. Well, anyway, the little moments can bring moments of being. You don't expect them. You, you, you just, it just doesn't happen. This is a poem called, My Wife Has Sent Me an Email. My wife has sent me an email. She asks if we have enough coffee for the weekend. She adds, I love you. I hit reply and type, 
Yes, we have plenty. Two bags of French roast, in fact. We'll be fine, I add. I love you, too. And hit send. I am sitting in our living room, laptop on my lap. She is sitting in her office, upstairs. <laughs> we are emailing in our own home. We have lived here for 35 years. Outside my window in the garden, outside hers in a window box, June's early rise of zinnias and salvia lifts to bloom amid the dusty miller. It is raining, the rain dousing the cosmos and Cleome as it falls from the roof. She emails, you should see this rain from up here. I email, you should see this rain from down here. <laughs> Yesterday, after a nice lunch together, I got up and went to the garage and sorted through the shelves, not knowing what I was looking for. After lunch today, I'm going to find the trowel my father used. I'll get a rag and some rust remover and bring it back. Uh, this is, <clears throat> don't need to say, of course, it's Memorial Day, um, weekend. Did any of you grow up calling it Decoration Day? Do you remember that? Calling it Decoration Day? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> My father was the captain of a black company in uh, World War II. And of course they were good for custodial work primarily. And um, so they cleaned up the rubble and remains, and he could never talk about that. It was, in some ways, I won't say more horrible, but being out of combat and cleaning up what's happened, let alone those who've been killed, is, uh, you don't get a Purple Heart for that. He also had to fight to get his men equal equipment. They were black. And... Um, it had a profound influence. My name's R-I-D-L, it should be H-R-I-D-L. Uh, we're talking about immigration a lot, of course. And um, it's Riedel. And I always think, if it weren't for Ellis Island, I would have a romantic, poetic last name. <laughs> Instead, it's Riddle. <laughs> it would be Jack Riedel. <laughs> so I'm Czech. Um, Czechs hug. That was also a difficult thing of moving into West Michigan. Uh, I hugged way too many people that first week, and then I learned pretty fast. Uh, do you know? Do I know you? <laughs> um, so keep hugging. Where was I? Oh, black company. Um, it had a profound influence on him. He grew up as a hunky. Uh, working in the mills, and so that was the denigrating term for Czechs and Poles. We were hunkies, not, there were niggers, there were hunkies, there were geeks, there were, you know, Japs. And we were hunkies. And uh, then when he became basketball coach in the late 50s, uh, and there's a handful of people who know this story, but I, I tell it everywhere I go, you know, we're conscious of civil rights, but there were these little moments of courage prior to civil rights that were quite remarkable. And one of them was um, in 1958, he started three black players in the game. And the next day, the president of the college called him in and he came home from lunch and we said, what happened? What was that about? And he said, well, he looked at me and then he held up two fingers, meaning, of course, he said he I'd gotten calls the night before and only start two black guys next game. And of course, it's an odd number with five, so it's interesting, that concept. Well, we were shaken to the core by that as kids. And I said to my father, oh my goodness, what are you going to do next game? And he said, <laughs> four. And he did. Those little, that sense of what happened to his men and the sense of, I don't need to tell you, but little acts of civil rights that are not conscious, they were built out of caring for others. Well, there, this actually, this is a kind of Memorial Day 
poem when he was he would write home to my mother during the war and he would he would say at the end of every letter he wrote he said this war will never end he really believed that he said i will spend my life in, with these men be home on furloughs etc this war will never end so it, it stayed deep um this is a this is a poem of, of being in a moment and um recognizing that that sense of being goes way back, right? You, you write the poem and then, you, you, by the way, I don't write with a, I have an idea of a preconception. The poems arrive, that sounds very mysterious, but I don't have a problem, I'm a mystical poet. <laughs> uh, but um, you find out afterwards in this poem how it resonated out into, uh, history, actually, and as well as the family. And then I'll read one more to close. Um, the drywallers listen to Sinatra while they work. These guys came to, we were rehabbing a house, and they were the drywallers, and they loved Sinatra, and I put on all the CDs. And drywallers listen to Sinatra while they work. This morning, my mother, here for the holidays, is washing the breakfast dishes. When Al, wiry, coated with drywall dust, takes her hand and says, I bet you love Sinatra. Dance? The acrid smell of plaster floats through the room. Frank is singing all or nothing at all. And Al leads my mother under the spinning ballroom lights across the new subfloor. He is smiling. She is looking over his shoulder. The other guys turn off their sanders. Al and my mother move through the dust. Two kids back together after the war. Sinatra holds his last note. It's been seven years since I danced, my mother says. Then it was in the kitchen too. Al smiles again, says, come on then, sweetheart, biting off his words like the ends of the good cigars he carries in his pocket. Sinatra's singing, my funny Valentine. And my mother lays her hand in Al's and they dance again. She looking away when she catches my eye. Al leading her back across the layers of dust. And I apologize for going over. I tried to watch that clock. But I'll close with a poem where the poem takes us into um, the being of another uh, that is difficult to find access to. You have the planet here and moving into the being of all that that lives with us on the planet that isn't a person. It's called the heron. Whenever we noticed her standing in the stream, still as a branch in dead air, we would grab our binoculars, watching her watching, her eye fixed on the water, slowly making its own way around stumps over a boulder under some leaves matted against the fallen log. She seemed to appear, stand, peer, then lift one leg, stretch it, let a foot quietly settle into the mud, then pull up her other foot, settle it, and stare again. Each step tendered an ideogram at the end of a calligrapher's brush. Every time she arrived, we watched until, as if she had suddenly heard a call in the sky, she would bend her knees, raise her wide wings, and lift into the welcome grace of the air, her legs extending back behind her, wings rising and falling elegant under the clouds. For more than a week now, we have not seen her. We watched the sky, hoping to catch her great, feathered cross moving above the trees. Namaste. <laughs>